To Kill a Mockingbird is a story about a fictitious town, Macomb, Alabama. It's a story about racism and justice and doing the right thing. It's a story about two young children, Scout and Jim, and how they're going to react when they discover that there is ugliness and evil in the world. But most of all, it's a story about a man, Atticus Finch. In 2003, the American Film Institute listed its top 50 movie heroes of all time. Atticus Finch was number one. Now, of course, that was before Vin Diesel burst on the scene and got all fast and furious, so he may be number one. I pray to God not. But anyhow, 2003, it was Atticus uh, Finch. And you have to wonder if the AFI really got it right, because Atticus is a small-town lawyer who takes on a case a black man has been falsely accused of rape by a white woman that he knows he is unlikely to win. Uh, as a matter of fact, he loses the case. His innocent client is found guilty. He takes on the case knowing that he's not going to be paid for his services and knowing that in the process, win or lose, he's going to alienate just about everybody in this little town. Not a smart business plan for a, an attorney in a little town. So why is he a hero? Well, one, because of the lessons he teaches us about courage and compassion. Another reason is because he's willing to stand up against prejudice and ignorance, even when it means standing alone. And thirdly, because even though he sees the world as it is and he himself endures so much, he's still able to keep a hopeful spirit about human beings and our capacity for goodness. But you still have to wonder, number one, I mean, there are other heroes who fought similar battles with similar odds, and yet they won their struggle for justice. So why is Atticus at the top of the list? Here's what I think. It's because of his relationship with his children. It's because of the way that he mentors them, loves them, the way that he shares wisdom with them and prepares them for the world to come. It's the way he fathers them. Now, next week, we are going to look at Remember the Titans, and because we are, uh, we're going to use that movie as our opportunity to look at how people, different kinds of people need to come together and make the world better together, overcome prejudice. Because we're going to look at Remember the Titans next week, I don't feel as compelled as otherwise I would to talk about the racial issues that are brought up in To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, instead, I want to focus on Atticus, this incredible father. I, I, I think he resonates with the hearts of everyone because deep down within every one of us, there is a desire for a father figure, someone of strength and kindness and compassion, someone who is wise and can help us make our way into the world. Really, it's a longing for, I believe, a heavenly father where people know that or not. Now, when we talk about fathers and when we talk about God as a father, that's difficult for some people. Some people growing up, they had a father who was either absent or abusive, and it's difficult to relate to God as a father. So you've heard me say it, but let me say it again. God is not the earthly father that you had. God is the father you deserved. And Atticus Finch, he does such a beautiful job of presenting to Scout and to Jim this father figure that when they see the world, and it no longer is simplistic, good and bad, but they discover that there's evil in people who are otherwise kind, there's ugliness in people who are otherwise good, and the question is, how are they going to process this? Are they going to shut down and become cynical and walk away? Or are they going to find a way to step into the world as they lose their innocence that believes in goodness? It didn't use the words of the song we just sang, but the question really is, how are they going to see the world? Are they going to see the world in wonder? Are they going to see the world in light? Are they going to see the world in gospel, in grace? Are they going to see the world in love? Are they going to close down and become cynical and walk away inside? And Atticus does this wonderful job of bringing them with a hand of wisdom and compassion into the world that it is and allowing them to have this hopeful spirit. 
And we all wanted that at one point in our lives because we were all there as well. We all want to believe that there is a Father above who is watching over us and doing that in our lives as well. Now, in movies and in television shows today, it's very common that men and fathers are presented as either weak and inept, as absent, or as abusive and, and brutal even. And we see some of those pictures of fathers in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, Bob Ewell beats his daughter, the woman who falsely accuses Tom Robinson of rape. Boo Radley's father is embarrassed, ashamed of his son because of his differences, what today we would call his special needs, and so he keeps him hidden in the house and doesn't get him the help that he needs. And the little boy that comes and visits in the summer, Dill Harris, by the way, this little boy, you'll see a clip in just a minute, he's based on a real character in Harper Lee's life. A little boy that she met in her real life who would come and visit his aunts during the summer. And they became fast friends. They were friends all their lives. Do you know who, who this little boy's based on? Truman Capote, <laughs> absolutely. They became close friends. She helped him work on In Cold Blood uh, later on in life. Dill Harris, his father is absent. We don't know why. Let's watch him describe his father. Well, just as an aside, Deal has my favorite line in the whole movie. When his aunt comes up behind him and startles him, he goes, Lordy, Aunt Stephanie, you nearly scared me a heart attack. Uh, the Southernisms in this music and this movie are just so wonderful. So Deal's father is absent. So he creates one. And what a grand one he creates. Why? Because his need is so great. So what we see in To Kill a Mockingbird are examples of men and fathers who are much less than what they should be. But it's not to bash fathers or men. It's to highlight the difference that a man, a father, a person like Atticus Finch can make in a family, in a community, and in the world. Now, I know that not all of us are, are parents, and some of us who are parents, our children are grown. And some of you whose children are grown are actually out of the house. And... Um, let me know what that's like one day, will you? So, <laughs> I love the fact that my son's living with us. Uh, but, but so not all of us are in a place where we're thinking about parenting. But many of us, we have a second chance at parenting, grandparenting. And the lessons that we learn from Atticus can also just help us in relating to each other as friends, as brothers and sisters, um, as a family in general. So let's look at Atticus and let's see what makes him such a great father and such a great man. Well, one thing that he does so well with his children is that he brings genuine affection into their lives. He is able to convey deep value and great love for his kids. Now, that's really job number one for all parents, to convey to their children that they are highly valued and deeply loved. The foundation that I am loved, that my parents care for me, that they are committed to me, that should be what all children are able to build their lives upon, and it is important. The Harvard-trained psychiatrist, M. Scott Peck, writes, the feeling of being valuable is essential to mental health. It is a direct product of parental love. When children have learned through the love of their parents to feel valuable, it is almost impossible for the vicissitudes of adulthood to destroy their spirits. Now, does that mean if you weren't given this blessing that your life is shot? No. Many people who grow up in a dysfunctional home are whole and healthy people, and they have whole and healthy families, but this is a huge blessing to give uh, to children. And it may surprise you, but an analysis of articles over a number of years in the general review of psychology indicate that a father's love or lack of it is every bit as important as a mother's love for a child's development and becoming a person who is secure in his or her own worth and value and then stepping into the world and becoming successful. How do we communicate this deep affection and love that we have for our kids? Well, the first is with our time. So you've heard the expression, time is money. 
there is a correlation there that states that we give time to things that we value. And it's a correlation that children, even at the youngest of ages, are able to make. I know that I'm valuable. I know that I possess worth because my parents spend time with me. They want to be with me. Now, if you saw the movie, you, you find that Atticus is this constant presence in the lives of his kids. You see that yeah, he is tucking them into bed at night. He's eating with them. He's always out on the porch talking with them. He is just always there. And the final scene of this movie, it's really very beautiful. The narrator, the scout figure, Harper Lee, is talking about Atticus and really who he is and what he has meant to her and uh, her brother. This is after Jim has been injured. And listen not only for what assurance this brings to children, but really to our deep yearning for God. Let's watch. Lo, I am with you forever, even to the end of the age, Jesus said. What we see in Atticus is a parent who is present in the lives of his children and gives them a sense of security, a presence that says you're not alone, you will not step out into this world by yourself because I am with you, and I am with you because you matter to me. Another way that we convey love and affection uh, is with touch, appropriate touch. Uh, if you watch the movie, you just see that Atticus, he's a pretty stiff character. He's a very formal character. But he finds it so natural to embrace his children. They run out to greet him as he comes home from work. And if you were to watch, you would see his hands just easily fall upon the shoulders of his children as he brings them close. He hugs them as he puts them into bed at night. And he's constantly out on the porch. And when he's talking to the kids, they're either leaning into him or sitting on his lap. Here's a scene that I just love. Scout has had a bad first day at school, and Atticus needs to comfort her. By the way, watch. He's been teaching her how to read. He's very proud of that. And the teacher slams the way he's doing it. It's, it's really wonderful to see his expression when he hears that. But concentrate on how he comforts his daughter. He's teaching a lesson as he holds her close. Years ago, the New York Times was interviewing Marilyn Monroe. The reporter knew that she had been shuffled about from one foster home to another as she was growing up. And he asked this question, was there ever a time in any of those homes where you felt loved? And the actress said there was one. The lady of the house was putting on her makeup and I was watching her in the mirror from behind and she saw me and she stopped and she took her rouge puff and she touched both of my cheeks. And for that moment, I felt loved. Something that took two seconds and yet was remembered years later. Why? Because touch says that we are connected. It says we're bonded. Friends touch in ways that non-friends don't. Families embrace in ways that that um, non-family members don't. It says we are together in this world. And Smalley and Trent remind us of this. Parents need to know that neglecting to meaningfully touch their children starves them of genuine acceptance, so much so that it can drive them into the arms of someone else who is all too willing to touch them. I want to encourage you, it may not be your nature to be a hugger, but I want to encourage you to embrace your children, embrace your grandchildren. It's important that they feel that you are holding them dear. So another way that we convey this affection is with talk. And by that, I don't just mean our talking to our kids, but real conversation, talking back and forth, listening as well as talking. And, uh, and when this book first came out, some of those who reviewed it uh, said that Scout and Jim, that their vocabulary was too advanced for children their age. And others said, but look, look at the conversations that they have. Look at the way that their father talks to them, not down to them, but he causes them to think. He asks them questions so that they express their thoughts. Look at the amount of conversation that goes on between Atticus and his children. And it's very possible that the power of these conversations has elevated their vocabulary to what we see in this book. He's constantly communicating with them, talking and listening. Now, when I talk with people 
who are still struggling with what they experienced growing up, there are two complaints, there are many, but there are two primary complaints, one about the mom and one about the dad. And the complaint about the mom is this, she was always in my business, man. <laughs> she had to know everything, where I was going, who I was going with, what I was going to do when I was there, when I was coming back, and when I got home, I got grilled about all of that to make certain the facts still lined up with what I told her it was going to be. It was like a quiz 24-7. Now, with dads, it was very different. Men and women, grown men and women have told me this, and they say it with a real sense of loss. They say, I felt like my father never knew me, and I felt like I never knew him. Kids want to know their parents. They want to believe that they are known by their parents. That means we have to have conversations, not to learn information to fix something, change something, address something, but conversations where we ask questions so we can hear what's inside a child's heart, what they're thinking. And that's important at any age. All of this is. Uh, Edwin Cole is a pastor. He writes in one of his books about a family that asked to meet with him. The 13-year-old daughter was angry and embittered towards them. She had run away, had been gone for weeks. She had come back, and they were hoping that they could make things better. And so they asked him to meet, and then after a few minutes talking with the three of them, he asked if he could meet with the daughter by herself. And he asked her about her mother, and she said a few kind things. And about the father, at first she didn't say anything at all. And then finally she said, well, I just don't talk to him. I said, why not? said, because he doesn't listen. No sooner do I start telling him something than he starts telling me what I'm doing wrong. And the longer I talk, he always takes the other side. He never listens. He never tries to understand. So I've just quit talking to him. Cole came back out, sat them all down and said, listen, you've asked me to pray for your family. I will. You've asked me to counsel your family. I will on one condition. And then he looked at the father and said, the condition is this. For the next four weeks, your daughter gets to tell you anything she wants, any way she wants, any time she wants. And you don't get to say a word. All you can do is listen. Will you do that? He said, I don't know if I can. And Dr. Cole said, well, then I'm not going to pray for you and I'm not going to counsel you because it won't do any good. And the father begrudgingly said he would. But he didn't keep his promise. He didn't have to. At the end of three weeks, the daughter came in, sat at the foot of his bed, and said, okay, I'm done now. What do you want to say to me? When you and I are going through hard times, we may want somebody who knows the answers and tell us what to do, maybe. But I know we want someone who listens, who wants to understand, who helps us feel like we're not in this alone because we matter to them. Um, I would encourage you to have good conversations with your kids. Ask to learn about who they are, whatever their age is, what they're struggling with, what they desire, what they're working through. Now, if you are a young parent with young children, I know this is like really difficult. I remember those times. I remember all the stress, all the pressure. You're trying to do something with your career. You've got your whole future, and you want to get off to a good start so you can provide for your family. And it is so hard to take time and to spend time with your kids. I look back on those years, and I wish to God I'd done some things differently in balancing home and work. But we get ego-driven, and we get our sense of self called up with how we perform, even if those of us who work for God do that, you know. Take it from somebody who's been down that road. You will never regret the sacrifices you make to spend time with your kids, to put them first, to let them know that they're loved. Affection. The second thing that Atticus does so well is that he provides illustration. He provides a constructive example for how to live in this world. Now, this may surprise you, but psychologists say that we learn up to 85% of everything we know by watching other human beings, by learning from their example. It's called modeling. And that's one reason why children of alcoholics 
are at a higher risk of becoming alcoholic. They've been given an example. Here's how you handle stress and pressure and conflict. That's one reason why children have been abused are more likely to become abusers themselves, even though they know how painful abuse can be. It's also why children can learn lessons about integrity and honesty and kindness and generosity. It's not uh, in the movie, uh, but in the book, uh, Atticus says, before Jim looks at anyone else, he looks at me, and I've tried to live so I can look squarely back at him. Now, if you notice in the film, the children are just fascinated with Atticus. Uh, they want to watch him. They want to be around him. So when he tries the Tom Robinson case, even though they shouldn't be in the courthouse, they slip in and they get up in the balcony and watch. And when their dad goes to face down a mob that wants to lynch Tom, he's told him to stay home. They follow and secretly watch. And when Atticus has to tell Tom Robinson's wife that he's been killed, um, Jim wants to go with him because he wants to see his father. Children are always watching, always learning from our example. Now, Atticus sets an example in two areas that are so important, and he does it so well. Uh, the first is he shows his children by example the importance of doing the right thing, what you might refer to as moral courage. Doing the right thing not because it's convenient or beneficial, but simply because it's right. So why do you defend a man who's been falsely accused? Not because you're going to get paid, not because it's going to make you any friends, but because it's right. And why is it that you go and face down an angry mob? Not because it's safe, but because it's right. And why is it do you go and you tell a woman that her husband's been killed when others can do it? Because you know that if it comes from you, as unpleasant as it is to tell her, it'll come from a heart that cares for her. It's right, and so you do it. Here's a, a scene where... Uh, Atticus describes why it is that he does what he does. Because it's right, and because I know you're watching, I'm setting an example for you. This past uh, Thursday, I performed a funeral for a retired pastor. He and his wife have been part of our congregation for probably the last 20 years. His name was Gail Williams. He was 91 years old. And I was really happy I had that opportunity because I got to tell a great story about Gail. So this happened probably in 1968, and as bad as race relations are today, if you will remember, some of you, things were worse then. Our cities were on fire. Police were unleashing attack dogs on black folks who had every right to march, and we wondered if our nation would stay together. And in some places in East Texas, it was worse than other places. And one of the places where it was really bad was a little town called Canton, where Gail was the pastor. And there was word around town that uh, there was going to be a march, that uh, African Americans were going to march through town. The word was that the Black Panthers were coming to town, and they were going to lead this march. And the word was also that the mayor had given the sheriff instructions that if they did that, the first one that set foot in the town, he was to meet them and he was to shoot the first one dead. Now, when Gail heard that, he was, he was concerned for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons was because that mayor was a member, an influential member of his church. Immediately, he went to the mayor's office. He asked, is this true? The mayor said, indeed it was. He'd given that order and he expected the sheriff to fulfill it. And Gail said, will you tell him that he'll have to shoot me first because I will be standing right between those protesters and him? Gail's children at my age, I cannot tell you how proud they are of their father. I cannot tell you how much they admire him, how grateful they are for the example he set and how he made them the men and the women that they are by his example. Doing the right thing, not because it's popular, not because it's easy, but simply because it's right. And Atticus provides that example. The world is not going to do that for your kids or your grandkids. The world won't do that for your friends. They need someone like you.
Now, the other thing that he provides a great example of is a, a spirit, a heart of generosity, a heart that's open to people, that looks for the goodness in others and tries to bring it out of others. Now, in this little town of Maycomb, Everybody knows their place. There is a pecking order, and everybody knows right where they are on it. At their top, there are wealthy white folk. And then there are poor white city folk. And then there are poor white country folk. And then there are black folk. And everybody knows how they treat everybody else, how they expect to be treated. Everybody knows who to look up to and who to look down upon. It's all spelled out. But Atticus doesn't play that game because he refuses to see people that way. He's decided that he's gonna put himself in the skin of other people and try to understand them from the inside out. And he decides that people, whether they deserve it or not, and you see it all throughout the movie, whether they're poor, whether they're black, whether they're white, whether they're good at heart, whether they are prejudiced, he is going to treat them on the basis of who they can be. He's going to do all that he can to bring out they're good. I love this quote from Booker T. Washington, uh, probably the primary African-American leader in the early 1900s. He said, I let no man drag me down so low as to make me hate him. I will treat you better than you deserve. That's what he said. And that's, that's really one of the great gifts that Dr. King gave us. He believed that white people could be better than their upbringing that we could be better than the prejudices that had been handed down to us, and so he gave us something to live up to. And Atticus does this very same thing. So the moral arc of this story is how will Jim and Scout respond when they see this ugliness and this prejudice and, and things they didn't know existed. And what they learn from their father is you treat people better than they deserve. You treat people as if they matter. And he sets that example for them. So the question for us is what do people see? Our kids, grandkids, others, what do they see in us? What example? Do they see us putting principle over pleasure? Do they see us doing the right thing even when it's inconvenient or costly? What do they see when they watch how we treat our spouse? How do they see us treat people that society says are beneath us? You know, I grew up with a father who said, yes, sir, to everybody. Uh, to people who were highly respected, he said, uh, yes, sir, to people that would call him up for a favor. He said, yes, sir, to gas station attendants, young folks. There was actually such a thing as a gas station and a gas station attendant. Uh, and I didn't understand, I didn't like it at first. I thought it was demeaning in some way. But I came to see what it is. It's beautiful, and it's noble, and it's gracious. And I say yes, sir, to everybody. And I'm glad I was given that example. Children will learn by example, your example. What do they see in you? Last thing, and this will be short, the last thing that Atticus does well is that he sets limitations for his kids. He gives them boundaries to live within. Uh, things that are valuable, things that we care about, we try to protect, we keep safe, and so we put something around them, a boundary, a barrier, uh, something to protect them. And that's what rules are for kids. And Atticus is good. He tells his children not to use racial slurs. He tells them not to add to the misery of this Radley family that's been through so much. They're strange, but you leave them alone. He tells them not to fight. He has expectations for them. Now, when it comes to setting standards and enforcing them for our kids, there are two mistakes that we often make. One is being too strict coming at our kids with a spirit of harshness or severity, and no one thinks that that creates healthy children or healthy adults later in life. Certainly the Bible doesn't. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And what that means is that discipline is never meant to break a child's spirit. That's not the goal. Uh, what it means is that the purpose of discipline is to teach a child self-discipline, to instruct them in the ways that will bring them life. And, and so our standards can never be unreachable or unreasonable, and our methods can never be dehumanizing or demeaning. 
It's a way to tell children that we expect the best of them because we believe that they are valuable. The other mistake that we make is that we're too lenient. Either we don't set standards or we don't enforce them. From time to time, I do teach a class called Making Peace with Your Past. And I do it primarily with men now. I have for many years. And these men, they have the opportunity to talk about things that they're still struggling with, things that hurt them growing up. And sometimes it is a father or mother who was too harsh and demeaning. But I was surprised, I should have known it, but I've had several men over the years who have said, I didn't have any rules. And I acted like I loved it. I got to go anywhere, stay out as late as I want. I drank, I did drugs, I skipped school, and I was never held accountable for it. And then they'll say, even then, I knew that meant that I didn't matter to anybody. That no one felt that I was worth protecting. No one felt it was worth the effort of making me do right. We don't put rules on kids because we want to win and we want them to lose. It's because we want them to know that they're valuable. And I know that when you're young and when you're struggling, it, it takes time, it takes effort, but it's important that we let our kids know that they are valuable. And one way we do that is we have rules and we do that hard work of enforcing them. Look what Roy uh, Lesson writes. He says, rules for children are like a pole alongside a tall plant growing in a garden. The pole is not there to stop the plant's development but to help guide it into maturity and productivity. Here's the last thought for you. Um, several years ago now, I was in India, I'm part of a mission team from our church. And one of the highlights was going to the museum shrine that is situated the place that Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated. Now, if you know anything about his achievement, I don't know that there was a greater victory in the history of the world than what he was able to pull off through nonviolence, and that was wresting India away from Great Britain, the crown jewel, if you will, of the British Empire. It's a magnificent achievement. He was asked at one point by a reporter, what is your message to the world? I didn't know about that, but it was printed on the wall of that museum. Mr. Gandhi, what is your message to the world? And Gandhi simply said, my life is my message. Your life is your message. Not your words, not what you say you believe, but your life is your message. And your kids and your grandkids and your friends are watching. We want to give a message like Atticus, that we're going to believe that there's good in the world that we're going to believe that people can be redeemed, that we believe in a balance of grace and truth, and that we believe that doing the right thing, no matter what the cost, is always worth it. And our hope and prayer is that people will come to realize that we are who we are because we know Jesus, and they'll see what he can do for them as well. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.